he has worked in forensics for about seven years, specifically in the firearms and tool mark field. He has worked in Virginia, Texas, and North Carolina. Currently, he is a forensic scientist with the North Carolina State Crime Lab. Let's welcome to the stage, Joseph Perrion. Uh, just by a show of hands, how many people watch CSI, NCIS, any of those crime shows that shows you how forensics is done? Would you be surprised if I told you 95% of those shows are incorrect and made up? <laughs> so I'm going to talk about what we really do in the lab, specifically in the firearms and tool marks section. But before I actually get into it, um, I work for the Department of Justice in the state of North Carolina in the uh, crime laboratory. We have three different crime laboratories in the state. One is in Raleigh, which is one I work at. We have one in Triad, and then we have a Western lab that's all the way out near Asheville. And in the Raleigh lab, we pretty much cover all of the disciplines, which I will talk about in a minute. Um, and then the Western and Triad lab have uh, less of the disciplines that we um, kind of cover. So, in forensic science, we have these main categories of evidence that we look at. We have digital evidence, which is computers. They can pull pretty much any information off of any electronic device now, including your car. Um, tasers, cell phones, computers, everything. Um, then we have the DNA database, which strictly works with CODIS, which I have a feeling a lot of people know what CODIS is due to those shows, and they're always like, I put in the DNA, and it's a match to John Mayer, but not the real one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's not what happens in that section. People just put in DNA and then they have to go through an entire database of people with a list of similar matches and then they have to decide whether or not it's actually good enough to make an identification or even like bring it back to the lab for more comparison. Then we have drug chemistry, which deals with everything on this planet that has to do with drugs, including anything that happens in Breaking Bad, it goes straight to there. Um, then we have my section, which is firearms. Um, which we'll talk about in great detail in a second. Uh, forensic biology, which is mainly dealing with um, any biological fluid that is found at a crime scene. Um, fingerprints, which is also known as latent prints. Toxicology mainly deals with anything that comes out of your blood that they're gonna look at. And then we have trace evidence, which is um, anything that can't be seen by the human eye that is small enough that needs to be examined, like hair, fibers, glass, everything. All right, firearms, my specialty. Uh, so like I said, I'm Joseph Perry, and I'm a forensic scientist one in the firearms section. I've been there for about two years now, and these are the degrees I have, but you don't need those to do what I do. <laughs> so since we're doing, we're dealing with firearms, these things are used to kill everybody on a daily basis in this country nowadays, so we have four basic rules that we follow, because these things kill people on a daily basis in this country. Um, so we're always gonna keep the firearm pointed in a safe direction. We're always gonna make sure that the firearm is treated like it is loaded. Um, we're gonna keep our finger off the trigger until we're ready to shoot. And then we're gonna know what's beyond our target because if we don't know what's beyond our target, we can have a really bad accident. Um, this is those same exact things but in a little more detail. So we're gonna keep on moving. Um, so now we're gonna talk about the type of exams we do in the lab in firearms. So we do a thing called a function test, which is pretty much going to test the condition of the firearm, whether or not it actually works. We're gonna test the safeties of the firearm. It's a little video of how the firearm actually works if you wanna look at that while I'm talking. Um, we're gonna test the magazine capacity. We're gonna test fire it. And then if we need to, we're going to do the uh, trigger pull, which weighs how much force it takes to fire the firearm. Another exam we do is um, test firing, which is the fun part, which is shooting the guns in our shooting range or in our, in our water tank. This is my old supervisor, Scott, shooting in our Kevlar tube and our water tank. Um, we do serial number restoration, which is kind of interesting and fun. If someone decides to scratch off the serial number on a firearm, we can pull the number out again because the metal that's being imprinted um, by a press or laser etched or whatever is affecting the metal far beneath the surface and we can pull the number back. Also, it's five to 10 years if you have a firearm that has a serial number scratched off, even if you didn't do it, just a reminder. Um, all right. Oop. 
all right, that video's not working, so we're just gonna move on. Uh, we do caliber determination. Sometimes we just get bullets from a crime scene or from a body that we need to determine what kind of caliber the bullet is, and we determine that by weighing it and measuring it in several different ways to determine the class of caliber it is. It's never an exact caliber because caliber is like a 40 caliber and a 10 millimeter are literally the same diameter, except they're in two different measurement systems. 40's in the standard, 10 millimeters in the metric. If you measure them, they're exactly the same the, as the bullet. The cartridge cases are a little different. We have a, our own database in firearms called NIBIN, which stands for the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network, which is pretty much the CODIS of firearms. We submit evidence into it. It comes back with a list of most similar images. We use an instrument called Brass Tracks, which takes both 3D and 2D images, and this allows us to link um, different uh, cartridge cases found at different scenes to each other if needed, or to different scenes like in completely different states. I think we go against Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia, and in South Carolina. I almost forgot about that one. Um, we, do fire, we do firearms examination comparisons where we will see if bullets were fired out of the firearm that was submitted um, with cartridge cases found at the crime scene. Now, the way we do this is under a microscope. It's a comparison microscope. It pretty much has one optical path that leads to two different um, microscopes that allows us to look at two different pieces of evidence at the same time. It's very hard to see on this image, but there's a black line down the middle of that. Those are two different cartridge cases that we're looking at. And as you can see, the lines and the striations, as they're called, are being carried across that line, which is indicating that this cartridge, these two cartridge cases were fired from the same firearm. All right, so how do we do this? We have to do several different steps, looking at several different pieces of information. I'm not gonna read all of this to you because it is a lot of information and I only have five minutes. So we're gonna move on. Um, there is another big thing that we look at before we start, before we get into the big microscopic, microscopic start is um, class characteristics. Now this is something that a manufacturer will decide beforehand, before they even start making anything. If you wanna think about it in the sense of having a car, Honda is a manufacturer and they make a CRV as a model. That is a class characteristic if you want to put it like that. So when Glock decides to make their firearms, nine millimeter is their class characteristic for their firearm. So that's kind of like shrinking it down from, okay, it's not a 40 um, Smith & Wesson, it's not a 50 caliber, it's a nine millimeter Luger. And then there are other categories that fall into this, and then we have, um, these other things for bullets specifically, where they're called twist. The twist is how the bullet rotates within the barrel of the lands and grooves. If anybody has ever thrown a football, you know that the football goes farther when it's in a spiral. Um, that's why bullets go farther and more accurate when they're in a spiral. So that's why we have this twist, or you get these lines on bullets if you've ever seen a fully intact bullet before. And those are class characteristics to the, to the bullet itself. Also, the number of lands and grooves, which are these kind of like two lines on this picture, are also um, class characteristics as well. All right, there's another big topic in my field, which is called subclass, which is still confusing to me because it's still relatively new. So it's a problem and we're working on it and that's all I'm gonna say about it right now. <laughs> there's like studies every week about it. Um, even more about it. So we have individual characteristics. Now individual characteristics are what makes it unique to that firearm. So I drive a Honda CRV. it's gray. These are all class characteristics of it, but the dent in the back bumper that I got when I pulled out of a parking garage and I hit the pillar because I was an idiot is this individual characteristic to my car and that's how I can know that it's my car. Or if I have a sticker on it that says, look at this dent that I put in my car is also um, an individual characteristic. It's these small, very small details that you can use to identify that it's yours. So when we talk about individual characteristics on bullets and cartridge cases, these are going to be microscopic details of what the tool leaves behind on the firearm, which is then imparted on the cartridge case or the bullet. And these are all accidental. This is never intentional. As a tool is used to make these different parts, 
it is either being chipped away or chips are being formed, which is always changing. There's a study done, it's been, it's been about 50 years now that it, since it started. It's called the Ruger 10 Barrel Consecutive Test, where they take 10 barrels that was made right out of the Ruger uh, manufacturer, and they fired bullets out of them, and then they sent the bullets out throughout the country to different examiners, and the examiners were able to put the bullets to the correct barrel, showing that the marks left behind, even if they were made right after each other, can still be identified back to the specific barrel. Um, and if you want to think about how the tool is used and made, you, want to, you can think about sandpaper. So if anybody's ever sandpapered anything, the, the surface you're sandpapering is changing, but the sandpaper is also changing. And you eventually have to change it out because it's, get, it's losing its grain, it's losing its like function. It's the same thing with tools, but it happens over a much longer period of time. Um, once again, talking about subclass versus individual characteristics. Subclass can mimic individual characteristics, which is why it's a problem in our field, because it looks like it's, a, it's an individual characteristic, but it's not. It's subclass, which is kind of like thinking about it like it only affects these 100 guns, and they'll all have this exact same pattern, where you can see how that could be an issue if I, not really, but if I go out and I shoot someone with a gun, and it, and this gentleman here has the same gun that has the same exact markings because they're subclass, he could possibly get in trouble instead of me. And that's where this issue is. And we've become very good at locating it and realizing it, but we're still doing constant research to try to get away from it. Um, this is a comparison microscope. It's a very fun and interesting tool. Um, lighting is the most important thing on this microscope because if you don't have the correct lighting, you can't see all of the markings and the unique detail. Um, so this is what we examine. We do uh, fired, fired in detail, which means that the, bullet, the cartridge case of the bullet's been fired. So breech face impressions, which is impressions that are left behind on the primer, which is the big silver circle. Um, we have firing pin impressions, which is the big hole in the middle. Um, we have the aperture shear, which is shear marks that are left behind from the hole that the firing pin comes out of. It kind of cuts off the primer, sorry I haven't been looking at you guys at all either. I'm gonna back up a little bit so you can see the screen a little bit more. Um, and then there's some, something called chamber detail, which is detail that is put onto the cartridge case as it expands within the chamber of the firearm. And then we have cycling marks, which are ejector, extractor, and um, feeding marks from the magazine. Um, like I said earlier, we have landing groove impressions. Here's the spiral that's made within um, barrels on the side. Uh, shotguns don't have any rifling in them because shot pellets don't need rifling to go f to fly out because shotguns aren't as accurate as a bullet. And if you have a slug in a shotgun, they'll always be pre-rifled as well. So they have a spin imparted on them. And then these are what these striations on these landing groove impressions look like that are left behind from the barrel. So you can see this, these are all at like 100 times magnification as well. And these are the different results that we come with. We have an identification, which means that the two bullets or the two cartridge cases had enough information to make an identification saying that this bullet, this cartridge case came from this gun. We have an elimination to say that there was enough to um, eliminate that these two were fired from the same gun. We have another thing called inclusive, which means that it means that we don't have enough to say that it did, and we don't have enough to say that it didn't. Um, this also is what we could use when we have a lot of subclass present, and then we have another one where subclass isn't present. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. All right. There. That's it. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs>